Usually when someone leaves a cult or extreme religion, it can be cause for celebration. They've managed to quote unquote wake up and reject toxic beliefs that could harm themselves or others. But what if rather than rejecting those beliefs and living a normal life on the outside, they became one of the United States most diabolical and meticulous serial killers? And if this person does leave the cult and become so evil, does that in some way justify the cult's us versus them mentality? That those outside the group are inherently evil, and if you leave, you become evil too. Today we're going to explore the life and harrowing crimes of Israel Keys and try to understand how a monster like him can even exist and how he got away with his behavior for so long. Thank you for being here. It's time to open a window and let the fresh air in. Hi everyone, my name is Erin and welcome to Let the Fresh Erin where we explore true crime, cults, and different spiritual practices. Now, I'm also a big bookworm and I like to recommend a book to everybody at the beginning of my video and this week's book is Behind Closed Doors by B.A. Paris. It is a lot. It is, I mean, I read it back in March of this year and I am still thinking about it. It still keeps me up at night. It's one of those books that is just incredibly psychologically thrilling and honestly it makes you wonder like what if you have to escape some type of scary domestic situation and how would you do it? So highly, highly, highly recommend this book. And if you have read it, just let us know down in the comments how much you liked it, if you loved it, if it scared you, because it seriously, it's been like eight months since I've read it and I cannot stop thinking about it. Now, before we get into it, this case is the kind of case that keeps me up at night. It's literally my deepest, darkest fear. It's that idea that someone could just stalk a stranger with no motive besides just wanting to kill them. And that is seriously so terrifying to me. So please just be warned that this case is a lot. <laughs> I'm Erin and I'm fascinated by cults, extreme beliefs, and how those beliefs both justify and motivate crimes. So if you share this fascination, please consider subscribing to this channel. On Tuesdays, I like to explore a true crime case, and on Saturdays, I dive into a cult or some kind of extreme belief or spiritual practice, and that, in most cases, leads to more true crime. This case is a little bit different because although Israel Keys grew up off-grid in a white supremacist community, it doesn't seem like his crimes were motivated by these beliefs. In fact, he denounced his upbringing, was essentially shunned by his entire family, and he still went on to commit these atrocious crimes. His crimes weren't racially motivated, but seemed to instead be a source of entertainment for him. What makes Keyes such an anomaly is that we don't know exactly how many people he murdered. He operated under the radar for over a decade and only admitted to a certain number of crimes before he took his own life in a jail cell like the coward that he is. He's had the opportunity to provide closure to his victims' families, but to him, not exposing his actions to his own family and young daughter was more important to him. So he was selfish until the very end. Let's get right into it and explore his parents' cult-hopping behavior. Keyes was born on January 7, 1978, and was the second child of Heidi and John Keyes in Richmond, Utah. Being from Utah, the Mormon capital of the world, it may come as no surprise that his parents were members of the FLDS, or Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and whoa, that is a mouthful. <laughs> Now, the FLDS is the polygamous cult that branched off of the LDS so that they could practice polygamy. And like most cults, this separation led to even more extreme practices and beliefs. For example, members of the FLDS were encouraged to procreate within their own family to preserve their bloodline, which has actually led to many birth defects. Their prophet, Warren Jeffs, had the authority. He assigned wives to husbands and even would reassign wives to different husbands if their previous husbands disobeyed them. He also took it upon himself to marry other men's wives and even marry off children. The women wear long dresses that cover their arms and legs and often wear matching pastel colors to identify which husband they share. 
Warren Jeffs has also been known to assign and perform unions between men and children, marrying girls as young as 12 to very old men. And luckily, he is in jail because of these acts. In addition to these abhorrent practices, members of the FLDS were forbidden to engage in anything secular, so no movies, no internet, TV, celebrations, including birthdays, and basically no fun. They were essentially cut off from the outside world and lived in compounds together. As enticing as it may sound to live in a like-minded community, this is actually a form of isolation and control. Stephen Hassan, the world's cult expert, coined the BITE model as a way to describe the methods used to control people within a cult. The BITE model stands for the methods an authoritarian group uses to control its members. Behavioral control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. By cutting its members off from the outside world, giving specific and separate roles to women and men, and having a firm and extreme religious belief, the FLDS is successfully implementing the BITE model and is able to easily control its members because they aren't exposed to anything else. But apparently this wasn't extreme enough for Key's parents because they decided they needed even more separation from the outside world. So in 1983, the family moved to a piece of land in Colville, Washington to live their dream of being completely off-grid and living off the land. It was here the family attended the Ark Church, which later became Our Place Fellowship, and has been described by Keyes as an Amish-like church environment. Other resources describe Our Place Fellowship as practicing British Israelism, which apparently isn't considered inherently anti-Semitic or racist because it teaches that Europeans have forgotten that they are the chosen ones, not Jewish people so they need to remember that they are better than everyone else. Yeah, doesn't sound anti-Semitic at all. So although this church is considered more Amish-like, encouraging people to live off the grid, away from the control of the government, it does seem that British Israelism is a gateway to the more openly racist and anti-Semitic Christian identity religion, whose believers were encouraged to live off the grid, live off the land, on their own, and that the government was the enemy. They needed weapons to defend themselves, and they wanted to live where there were no minorities, basically creating their own white communities. So obviously, Keyes and his racist family decided to build a cabin in the woods. The cabin was being built very slowly though. So for the family of 12, yes, two parents and 10 children, they all lived in a large tent outside for years before Keyes helped his father complete the small cabin that they then all lived in together. It was here that Keyes became a skilled carpenter and a man of the wild. He learned how to sit sometimes for hours, to stalk and successfully hunt his prey. He became a very skilled marksman at a young age and hunted to provide food for his family. His family embraced this off-grid, anti-Semitic, white supremacist cult lifestyle. This was an area of the United States that at the time was known by white supremacists as the Northwest Frontier. Many members of the Christian identity movement moved to Eastern Washington and Northwest Idaho to celebrate their whiteness and be away from all minorities. It was a community full of church-going white supremacists, an area where it was common to hunt for your food, collect guns, and isolate yourself from the outside world and just be racist. Some of Key's childhood friends are none other than Chevy and Cheney Kehoe, known white supremacists whose murder spree ended in a shootout with Ohio State troopers in 1997. Now, although he had some friends who shared his interest in stealing from homes and starting fires in the woods, Keyes was a loner. Around the age of 17 is when Keyes began to realize that he was different than some of his peers. After trying to torture and kill a cat in front of his peers, their horrified reactions to the incident made him realize, oh, wow, not everyone likes this. And instead of thinking, well, then this must be a wrong thing for me to do, this moment is what sparked in him the idea that he would just keep his violence to himself from now on. It would just be private, just for him. And later, his mother would claim that she noticed some troubling signs in Keys around this time. And of course, being in a cult, she blamed it on the fact that perhaps he had been exposed to the radio. Yeah. But if you follow true crime, I think it's safe to say that if your kids are showing troubling signs, like harming 
torturing animals, shooting guns at neighbors' houses, and robbing people, maybe it's not the radio they're listening to, it's probably something deeper. You know, whenever I hear these stories, I just kind of wonder why the parents didn't feel more alarmed by the behavior and decide to bring the kid in for behavioral counseling or get additional help to try to understand the behavior. And the only thing I can speculate is that, one, mental health is only just becoming something that parents are feeling comfortable to talk to their children about. And two, if there's a problem with your child, then I think there's that implication or fear that it's a reflection of your poor parenting. So I speculate that that's part of why some children don't get the help that they obviously need. And of course, when you add in the whole cult aspect to this particular case, there's no way that Keys would have gotten any form of counseling at all. So I'm curious, you guys, what do you think? Am I totally wrong here and it's just a nature versus nurture issue and they couldn't? be helped, but um, please respectfully leave your opinions and comments down below. In his late teen years, he openly admitted to his parents that he didn't believe in God at all anymore. And with this, he was essentially kicked out of his family. His siblings were forbidden to speak to him ever again. Yeah, classic cult behavior. Now, Keyes has said in interviews that this is where he became interested in Satanism and wanted to commit some kind of murder ritual. Now, I looked more into this because I was curious what ritual that would be and why it would be significant to someone wanting to practice Satanism. But basically, what I learned is that the term Satan or quote-unquote Satanism was basically a term created to use for anyone who opposed Christianity, not necessarily someone who worshipped Satan. It's my understanding that Satan wasn't intended to mean an actual being, but just any opposition to Christian beliefs. And now, of course, there is the belief that Satan is a being that exists, and there are people who practice Satanism as a practice where they worship an entity, but this is definitely a topic I'm going to dive deeper into next month, so please make sure you stick around for that video. It'll definitely come up on one of the Saturdays in October. Now, it's alleged that Keyes' first victim was Special Olympics medalist Julie Marie Harris, who was just 13 years old. Keyes never openly admitted to this murder. He was in Colville during the time her prosthetic feet were found by the Colville River. The idea that anyone could target someone so vulnerable is absolutely sickening to me. He never admitted to this murder, but he was 18 and living in the area when it is thought to have occurred. We also know that he preferred victims of a smaller stature because their bodies are easier to get rid of, according to him. Another alleged attack was on Marlene K. Emerson and her 12-year-old daughter, Cassie Emerson. Marlene's body was found burned in her trailer in Colville, and poor Cassie's body was found months later, 13 miles away. Now, He's never admitted to harming any young children, but he did admit to committing his first act of arson while living in Colville. But here's the first confirmed crime that we know of, and it was confirmed by Israel himself. Now, Keyes decided he would perform a human sacrifice and that his first victim would be a young girl who he saw floating down the Deschutes River. She was tubing with a group of friends, but then they all fell behind. Now, Keyes was somehow able to pull her from the water, bring her to the bathroom, and sexually assault her. For whatever reason, she was very talkative to him and asked him a lot of questions. Keyes was frustrated by this and theorized that perhaps this had happened to her before because she was a lot more talkative than he imagined she would be. She even said to him that he didn't need to assault her. He could have just asked her out if he was interested, which... I don't think I would ever be this brave, but this is the bravery that saved her life because Keyes was so frustrated by her, he let her go. Keyes did indicate that he regretted that he hadn't been more violent. If only he'd stopped there. After he broke free of his family, he ended up enlisting in the army. And although his family was anti-government, he had gained great marksmanship skills from his time living off-grid and also basically wanted to try everything his isolating religion had prevented him from experiencing. Now, this is purely speculation and completely anecdotal, but I can't help but wonder if the army had something to do with his ability to shut off all empathy towards his victims. You know, I've heard stories of people being trained in something like sniping and returning home a completely emotionless, non-empathetic person. Almost like being able to kill people at range required you to flip a switch off in your head. 
and not really see them as human anymore. So I just can't help but wonder if maybe that training could have contributed to his later mindset surrounding his behavior. But of course, I'm not entirely sure. What do you guys think? Now, after serving, Keyes moved to the Macaw Reservation in Nia Bay, Washington in 2001 to be with a woman named Tammy who he had met online. She was older than him and pretty independent. It would later come to light that this was a quality he looked for in women. Not because he found it particularly attractive, but because if they were independent and had their own goals and things to focus on, then they would ask him less questions and he could continue with his extracurricular activities. This would be the true beginning of his decade-long crime spree because Nia Bay is a boring town, according to him. It's like, dude, just get another hobby. Like, play a video game. Jesus. What's really scary about Keyes is he had a daughter with this woman, and he doted on both of them. Someone who worked with him on the reservation would later describe him as a man who was so proud of his daughter and spoke about his family often. He just seemed to be like a normal family man. And it's just so scary to think that you could know someone right now who seems to be a sweet family man who just works and focuses on his family, but he's secretly a deranged serial killer. It's just absolutely terrifying to me. Now, a lot of this is speculation, as we don't know for certain if all these cases were connected to Keyes because he was in the area where the crime took place. Unfortunately, we may never know. But it is believed that between 2001 and 2007, Keyes was somehow involved in the murder and or disappearance of eight people, including teenagers Cammie Vollendroff and Eugene Hyatt, Alice Looney, Kimberly Forbes, Wendy DeHoop, and Mike Mason all in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. The True Crime BS podcast made this amazing and detailed timeline of all of Key's crimes, and I have left the link to that in the description box below if you're curious and want to take a look. After meeting a new woman named Kimberly, Keyes decided to move with her to Anchorage, Alaska, and he brought his daughter with him. Now, Kimberly was a nurse and very independent, so she didn't mind that he traveled so often to visit family or to work, so he did it a lot. He traveled from Vermont down to Texas, robbing banks and burying kill kits along the way. He would stash his stolen money in these kill kits, and he'd put the money, guns, ammo, silencers, and anything else he might need to commit a crime or a murder, but couldn't bring on a plane into these kill kits. But I can't help but speculate if he ever had any work down in the lower 48. Did he have a contracting job and then just decide to randomly rob a bank while he was there? Or did he really have any work to do? Was he actually just traveling with a specific purpose to stalk his prey, hide a kill kit near where the future victims were, and then he obviously couldn't fly with all his murder supplies, so he would go back to Anchorage and then fly back, retrieve the kit, and commit the crime. See, this is what's so terrifying to me about him. He had absolutely no motive. He just traveled around looking for smaller people or would search for a home to break into that didn't have a dog or a child. His rules were simple. Kill and hide the body. Maybe steal what he could. The crimes weren't specifically sexually motivated, but he did sexually violate many of his victims. Now, again, we can only confirm two of these murders, but it is believed that he was involved in the murder or disappearances of Kathy McBroom, Deborah Feldman, Maddie Scott, Randy and Malitz Gorenberg, Nancy Bocciccio, Joey Bocciccio Hauser, Lauren Spearer, and Bill and Lorraine Courier. There could even be more. One of his tactics was flying into one airport, renting a car and driving to another state, committing the crime there, and then disposing of the body in another state. It just, it blows your mind, and it's scary how much time, effort, energy, and money he put into doing this. Imagine if you put this kind of effort into a real career. I think that the, the crimes that involve smart serial killers are some of the scariest because, you know, in the true crime genre, it can be really fun to like roast stupid criminals. You know, it can. Like when they are Google searching like how to hide a body and you're like, obviously you're guilty of trying to hide this body. But it's just so scary. He just seemed really smart and meticulous and specific and like almost like 
type A when it came to what he was doing. And, you know, you just can't help but consider that the off-grid living and the working around the governmental rules that he experienced growing up had to help him with this behavior. He knew how to track and stalk other people. He knew how to move without a trace. He knew the laws, so he learned how to get away with breaking them. He knew how to find the coordinates of buried supplies. He knew how to watch from a distance without being caught. He was hiding in plain sight. And again, that is the scariest kind of serial killer. He had no real pattern, no real victim type. He wasn't in one concentrated area. Someone like him could be lurking around your community right now and you would never know it. It just, it scares me to think about, like seriously, I've had to stop and start stop and start researching this case so many times because even my fiance is like like you're so scared at night or you're having nightmares like you need to take a breather like it's just it's really terrifying. Now, two murders that Keys confessed to were the murders of Lorraine and Bill Courier in Vermont. Now, this is a very brutal attack, and I'm going to share what I feel comfortable sharing, but you can find more detailed accounts in the resources in the description. There's also hours of interviews between the police and Keyes, and the way he describes this attack is so calm and casual, like he's talking about a football game he watched the other day. It's just absolutely nauseating to listen to, but I'm sure you'll be able to find it if you're so inclined. Now, Two years prior to the murders of Bill and Lorraine, he had hidden one of his kill kits near their house. He watched them, learned their patterns, considered their vulnerabilities, and one night broke into their home. He then drove them in their car to an abandoned house where he sexually violated and killed Lorraine after first shooting her husband. He then doused them in Drano to try to get rid of the fingerprints wrapped them in trash bags, and hid their bodies in the basement under other trash and debris. He had apparently been disappointed in this attack because there were some new things he wanted to try with these victims. But Lorraine and Bill put up such a fight that he wasn't able to achieve this goal. Later, when he helped the police try to find their bodies, they discovered that that abandoned house had been leveled and burned. It was no longer there, so their bodies were never found. Now, in 2012, Keyes begins to get sloppy and for the first time commits a murder that's super close to home, just a few miles from his house. And everything he does with this murder is like the opposite of what he's been known to be doing. Like, I don't know if whether he was getting impatient or bored or it was just this time around that he had begun fantasizing about having a quote unquote Stockholm sweetie, which Honestly, this might just be pure speculation on my part. Um, I'm just making this assumption based on the note he left in his jail cell after he took his own life. But part of this note reads, and it's very strange, um, but here we go. Violent metamorphosis, emerge my dark moth princess. I would come often and worship on the altar of your flesh. You shudder with revulsion and try to shrink far from me. I'll have you tied down and begging to become my Stockholm sweetie. Now, I personally speculate that this is a reference to Stockholm Syndrome, where a prisoner begins to empathize and even becomes attached to their captor. So I'm just wondering if maybe he thought this next victim would be his Stockholm sweetie, and that's why he planned an attack so close to home. So Keys had been watching Samantha Koenig at her new job at the small kiosk coffee shop called Common Grounds. He stalked her, watched her routine, knew that she oftentimes worked alone. He also knew that she wouldn't have an easy escape as she often got a ride home from work from someone else. Before the coffee shop closed on February 1st, 2012, he walked up to the window, ordered a coffee. Samantha turned around to make the coffee, and when she turned back to hand it to Keys, he had a gun pointed at her. He demanded the money from the register and then ambushed her. He jumped into the window and with gun in hand, led her outside to his car where she tried to run away, but she couldn't fight his grasp. 
He drove her to his own house, where he had a shed set up and prepared for her. He forced her inside and, oddly enough, gave her some wine. It's like he was, you know, trying to gain her trust. On the drive over, he had told her that he was using her to get ransom, so I'm sure this helped her let her guard down slightly, thinking that maybe she'd get out of this alive if she just cooperated. Now, he had asked her for her ID and debit card because, obviously, it wasn't enough to kill her. He had to take her money as well, but she didn't have it. She had left it in her car at her boyfriend's house, so Keyes demanded his address and made sure Samantha was tied up. He blasted heavy metal music in the shed in case she decided to scream, and then he drove to her boyfriend's house and stole the debit card right out of her truck. And get this, her boyfriend saw him. Her boyfriend was supposed to pick her up from the coffee kiosk, but when he went to go get her, she wasn't there. Apparently, they had fought earlier in the day, and he just, like, assumed that she was blowing him off. She'd sent, you know, she'd sent him this really strange text that she was going off with other friends. It was just all very, very strange to him. And I, I can't believe he didn't consider that the two things could have been connected. You know, like his girlfriend isn't responding to his texts and wasn't there to get picked up and now there's a masked man outside breaking into her car like wouldn't you think oh this is cause for alarm i should tell the police but i don't know you know he's a kid at the same time and i'm sure seeing a masked man outside was really terrifying and apparently he did run inside to tell his parents about what he saw so keys was able to steal her debit card and return to his creepy little shed now this i I couldn't go too in depth on this case. Um, I heard about what happened once and decided it's not something I wanted to retell. So please go over to Annie Elise's channel. She does an excellent retelling of it or the True B True Crime BS podcast. Um, any of the references, resources I have mentioned would be great. Um, but just trigger warning, it's very disturbing and upsetting. There are photos regarding what happens next, so I've left resources to those if you want more in-depth descriptions, photos, but here we go. So while Israel's daughter and girlfriend were just feet away in their home, with his girlfriend's bedroom window just feet away from the shed, he cut off Samantha's clothes and violated her twice before strangling and stabbing her. And the stabbing wasn't to kill her, it was just for fun. He wrapped her body in a tarp and he hid her body in the shed. He literally left her there to freeze. So it's February in Alaska. It's going to get frigid. So he isn't taking the usual steps he might otherwise would have taken to dispose of a body. And plus he had a boat to catch. Yeah. Literally hours later, he and his girlfriend and daughter flew to New Orleans to catch a week-long Caribbean cruise. It's just, it's, it's shocking. Like, did he plan? I just don't understand. Like, he risked so much with this crime. He left the body for two weeks in his shed. It's like he just got super confident, like no one would ever be able to catch him and he could get away with it. Or if he saw maybe um, articles on the internet, he'd be able to stay away from Alaska. That's kind of what I'm guessing he, his like thought process through this was because he was known to not just look up cases he'd been involved with, it's speculated that he actually wrote comments about this case itself. So on one hand, it's just like super shocking. And it's it's just one thing to have a secret double life away from your family. You know, you hear of people having second families, having affairs, and those are absolutely terrible things. But to violate and murder a young girl and then go on his celebratory cruise is one of the most horrible and vile things I've ever heard. He's buying people drinks on the cruise and acting like this family man sailing in the Caribbean out in the sun while there's a young girl freezing in your shed whose family and boyfriend are just frantic, panicking about where she is. It's just, it's, it's literally too much to think about. I don't know if maybe he thought if he saw any red flags online, he would just stay in the Caribbean. I don't know. So two weeks later, they all returned to Alaska, but not before taking a pit stop in Texas, where Keyes robbed a bank and allegedly killed James Jimmy Lamar Tidwell Jr. It's absolutely unbelievable. It just starts to feel so casual. I think that's what's so shocking and scary about it is it's like he's so used to years of getting away with these heinous crimes 
that it's like running an errand. I need to go to the grocery store. Oh, I'm just going to go rob a bank real quick. And if I kill someone in the middle of it, no big deal. It's just, it's, it's sad. It's just really one of those jaw-dropping cases. So when Keyes returns to his home, he goes and he checks on Samantha. And I can't get too graphic, but a deeply concerning series of events happens here. I'm going to try to approach this as delicately as I can, but it's vile. So Keyes thaws out her body and violates it. He sews her eyes back open and puts makeup on her. He wants to try to make her look as alive as possible. After two weeks of being dead and frozen in a shed in Alaska in February, this man had the audacity to go through with his bribery of money to his family. He took a picture of her with that day's newspaper to send to her family with a ransom note. Can you can you imagine being her parents and and later finding out that the picture that you saw of your daughter after she was missing for two weeks, you're searching high and low, you are praying that she is safe and unharmed. The picture that brought you so much joy after weeks of despair and concern was actually your dead daughter's face. I cannot imagine how terrible that would be to see and realize. So he still has Samantha's phone. So he sends a text to Samantha's boyfriend with information on how to find her with instructions regarding the ransom. So yeah, yeah, he's still trying to get the ransom. The instructions demanded that $30,000 be deposited into Samantha's debit card account. By the time the money was deposited, Keyes had already dismembered Samantha's body and disposed of her remains in Matanuska Lake. So Keyes begins withdrawing this money. He always wore a mask and covered his face before making a withdrawal. So although law enforcement was getting alerted every time he used the card, he always seemed to slip through their fingers until he slipped up in Arizona. He pulled his car up to the ATM and withdrew money. His car was caught on camera with a clear picture of the car he was driving. The next time he used the car was in New Mexico. So law enforcement was able to guesstimate his route and notify authorities. On March 13th, 2012, after recognizing Keyes' rented white Ford Focus, Texas Highway Patrol pulled Keyes over for going slightly over the speed limit. They searched his car and found Samantha's debit card and cell phone. Keyes was subsequently arrested and extradited to Alaska. Now, there are like 40 hours of interviews with Keyes, and he makes a lot of demands and a lot of jokes. It is just disgusting. It's literally like nothing bothers him at all. He still doesn't like understand the scope of what he's done, but he's simultaneously afraid that his daughter's going to find out what he did. So he wants like nothing to be out in public record. He just is so afraid that his family's gonna find out what he did. We also learned that he had begun preparing for retirement. His retirement plan was to make a dungeon in his home. His preparation included burying tools that could be used to dispose of bodies that he had hidden along Eagle River. It's just, it's eerie, it's creepy. He's 34 years old and he's so obsessed with killing and dismembering people and doing these things that he's already thinking about his retirement plan. It's just like, retirement means you stop doing the crap you've been doing your whole life. Can you just retire? Can you just give it a rest? So Keyes offers to make some confessions, but one of his stipulations was that he didn't want details getting out into the media. Like I said, he was deeply concerned that his daughter was going to find out what he did. And it's just so frustrating to hear because in my opinion, don't do bad things if you don't want to get caught doing those bad things. So this is why it is so difficult to find a lot of information about him and why there's so much speculated about his crimes. I, I must say that I do feel for his daughter and girlfriend and his whole family, really. You know, to wake up to the realization that you've been so deceived and so gruesomely deceived that someone you love is capable of these things, it's really just too much to bear. So Keyes confessed to several, but not all of his murders. And 
Apparently, he tried to use the wood shavings from a pencil to pick his handcuffs during a hearing to try to escape. And it's like he just he's it's like he's digressed. He just gets dumber and dumber. He simultaneously asks for the death penalty within a year, but he also tries to escape arrest. It's like you don't get to make the decision anymore, dude. You're done making decisions, okay? You've made plenty of choices for other people. Now other people get to make the choices for you. Unfortunately, he ended his own life in his jail cell on December 2nd, 2012. Somehow, he got a razor blade and used that to slit his wrists. Now, I say unfortunately because although, yes, we know a lot about him and how he operated and the really gruesome details of some of his assaults and murders, but there are potentially so many more victims that deserve closure and they'll never get it. And my heart really does go out to every single victim, whether they were confirmed or allegedly harmed by Israel Keys. It's cases like this that really get under your skin. They are tragic and the acts are unthinkable. But what I think we can learn from this case is to switch up your routine, if at all possible. You know, I know in America, we live in a society that almost requires you to have a routine, but do your best to switch it up sometimes, whether that means you exit the back door of your home one morning, or instead of going to the gym closest to your house before work, you go to a gym on the other side of town after work. Just switch it up sometimes. Never, ever open your door to a stranger. Have some kind of security system in place, whether it's a ring camera, an alarm system, motion lights, a door buddy, all of the above. You can just never be too safe. And if he has a man cave, like an unattached garage or a shed, and for whatever reason, you, his partner, are not allowed to go in it, you need to go in it. Now, this next little bit really boiled my blood. Um... And I'll tell you why. So the Keys family pastor, Jake Gardner, is quoted saying, Israel rejected the gospel and thus the outcome of his life is this tragic story, which I just think is a terrible thing to say and to imply, especially regarding the hateful rhetoric Keys was brought up in. And I guess it just proves my theory from the start of this video that when you leave an extreme group and go out into the real world and become evil yourself, it's because anyone who doesn't believe what you believe is evil. And that, in my opinion, is a dangerous way to operate. People don't commit murder because they leave a church or a cult, especially a church or cult that seems to have taught Keys so many of the skills that he needed to perform these outrageous crimes. He grew up in an off-grid community where he was expected to hunt and kill things from a very early age. He was conditioned to hate certain kinds of people. So I think it's really dangerous to make statements like this because of the implications that they can have on a bigger scale. Honestly, that remark, in my opinion, is incredibly insensitive. And what does it say about the victims? Is it simple that Keys turned away from God and the church to go harm innocent people? What about them? What's their relationship with God like? What does it mean for them? It just, it's, it's just, it diminishes the larger issue at hand, which is this is a person that was deeply disturbed. And I'm not saying that his parents could have changed the outcome at all. I'm not implying that. I'm just saying that this is like a guilt tactic that the church is using now to keep people in because otherwise they may go and murder people because the devil will get in their head. And maybe you could argue that the devil did get in Keyes' head, but I just think it's like really dangerous for other people who consider themselves Christian to hear that if they turn away from God, they will become a mass murderer. I just think it's, again, incredibly insensitive and that pastor should truly be ashamed that that was a statement that he chose to make. Well, everyone, I know that was a lot, and I really appreciate you for taking the time to listen to this story, to my opinions, and to my speculations, and for supporting my channel. Please like, share, and subscribe if you're so inclined, and just always remember to ask questions, think critically, and just be safe out there. I hope you have a great rest of your week and sleep very well. 
Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video very soon. Thank you.